Hi there. Um, the <clears throat> publication of uh, Who Dares Wins by Tony Geraghty was um, really the start of uh, quite a, a huge interest in um, SAS and Special Forces books. The Soldier Eye was really uh, the, the first inside look uh, at the modern SAS, uh, particularly around the embassy siege in the Falklands. But then after that, there was nothing for quite a while until um, after the uh, first Gulf War. And what happened was that uh, General uh, de la Billiere, who had been um, in charge of Brit the British um, effort in the first Gulf War, wrote his book, uh, Storm Command, and um, he uh, went into uh, the regiment's base and uh, found out uh, some of the stories, some of the information, the facts uh, to put in his book. And in fact, Chris Ryan, who was still serving at the time, was ordered against his own protest to sit down with a, a researcher uh, and tell his story for the benefit of DLB. So after DLB's book was published, the attitude amongst the lads, well, if it's okay for the officers, then surely it should be okay for us. And uh, the book started to be written, um, starting with Bravo 2-0 by Andy McNabb, which has become I understand the, the best-selling military history book of all time. Now, Andy McNabb had been an infantry sergeant, uh, joined the SAS and worked his way up to a uh, special forces sergeant. And at the time of the First Gulf War, he, he was in uh, B Squadron. And B Squadron were late to the festivities, having handed over the uh, counter-terrorist role to G Squadron and uh, then went over to the Middle East. Uh, a and D were already over there. The two squadrons were already over there. And really, B Squadron was um, lacking in a role and lacking in equipment uh, because uh, there were already two squadrons deployed. Now, th this was, um, since, since the Falklands, was the biggest uh, deployment of special forces where only one squadron remained in the UK. So it was ter terrific um, manpower and uh, equipment drain. So um, they are given a role, and uh, the role is um, to uh, provide eyes on the various routes that the SCUDs would be taking and looking for SCUD launch sites. And uh, three patrols were um, stood up. Bravo 1 0, Bravo 2 0, and Bravo 3 0. Acting independently, they were not um, let in on each other's uh, plans, but they inserted together on, on the same uh, airframe. So <clears throat> the book uh, describes the build up, the planning by the patrol, the kit preparation, where each member had his own uh, responsibilities, whether it was medic demolitions, uh, comms, etc. Uh, assembles the kit, tests it, make sure it's uh, suitable, make sure every every other member is cross-briefed on it, uh, on, on procedures and so on. And it, it's it's very, very interesting uh, look at how special forces uh, teams operate, uh, or plan an operation rather. Um, quite exhaustive. One of the controversial issues that arose um, as a result of the book and uh, has been discussed ever since was the fact that Bravo 20 decided not to go in by vehicle. And the reason for this was <clears throat> it was their decision and they, uh, they were unanimous within the patrol on it. But um, the, the long wheelbase Land Rovers, the 110s, had all been snaffled by the other two squadrons and they would have had to have used the dinkies, the small versions, and they didn't think they were suitable. And for various reasons, they thought that they would be um, much more uh, prone to being discovered 
uh, uh, with a, a vehicle than on foot. And so anyway, so be it. They went in on foot. So um, they go in. Uh, they're inserted, uh, and straight away they're in a very desolate area, except they're hard up against an enemy position and uh, almost immediately compromised by a goat herder. They get into firefights, they're on the run, the patrol splits into two elements, and at the end, only uh, Chris Ryan manages to escape. He gets to Syria on an amazingly long E&E. &E. Um, all the others are either killed or captured. Andy McNabb ends up in Abu Ghraib, um, being tortured. And here the SAS training in resistance to interrogation is discussed because uh, the realities are you, you can't say nothing. The uh, resistance to interrogation is you can only give the big four and uh, not allowed to say anything else. Any other word gets you um, um, RTU. So, uh, but that was not really possible. You can do it for a limited time, apparently, but under the sustained pressure and the beatings and so on, and, and the threats and the stress, um, you've got to start feeding them something. And they had prepared a cover story where they were um, a, a rescue package for air crew, and that's what they fed them. And um, <clears throat> apparently that satisfied them. They never really disclosed that they were special forces, uh, even though the kit would have been a major clue to it. So, <clears throat> lessons learned. Well, the main lessons really were the failures in the um, the head shed. There, there were um, failures in the signals. They were given the wrong frequencies. Um, the mapping was pathetic. They weren't giving, given uh, uh, either maps or air photos uh, of sufficient um, definition and relevance. And one of the reasons for this, again, that's come out since, is um, OPSEC. The regiment didn't want to ask the Americans for the relevant mapping and aerial photos and satellite photos um, for reasons of operational security. Now, to me, uh, as a, as a complete outsider, uh, it, it, it seems rather curious because <clears throat> for a start, the Americans know you're there. I mean, they, they transited through an American air base in Germany, so they know British Special Forces are there. They're up again. Their own Special Forces are there. So what else are they going to be doing? They're going to be <clears throat> operating within Iraq. I mean, that's the role. And they don't need to know any more than that to to um, be requested um, the appropriate intelligence and mapping. Um, if we look back at the Falklands, the Americans uh, who were not involved, didn't have a dog in the fight, nevertheless gave the regiment um, the uh, satellite communication links and also Stinger missiles. Uh, as well as a certain amount of intelligence. So but they, there was no OPSEC problem then, uh, even though the Americans were, were one of the intermediaries with the Argentinian enemy. So, uh, you know, you can take OPSEC too far, apparently. Uh, the, the other thing was the weather. And no one anticipated, apparently, that um, January and February in uh, Iraq is uh, very cold. Now, the SAS was born in the desert. And if you look at the pictures of Sterling and his guys, they were wearing duffel coats. And there's a reason for this. It gets very, very cold. And um, particularly in the winter, uh, in the winter months, it, it's pretty obvious. So that was really a big failure, the fact that they didn't take um, uh, proper, appropriate cold weather gear with them. Um, and, and to a large extent, uh, the head shed abandoned them. They would not al allow um, uh, any forces or any airframes to be dedicated to searching for them once they were on the run. The book is filled with <clears throat> typical 
um, British Army humour and wit. The guys uh, continually uh, ragging each other verbally, uh, even at the lowest ebb when, when the teeth are chattering and, and uh, the freezing and, and they can't even heat up a, a cup of tea because of, of uh, the uh, guns of the enemy. They will find something funny to laugh at. And uh, th this comes through the book. It's very well written. It's written in a very engaging way. It's very interesting. <clears throat> I, I took copies when it was first published over to the States for a couple of friends. I, I gave Marcus a copy and Scotty a copy. And they, they devoured it. They thought it was fantastic. And it really was a good insight in, into the mentality of um, the guys who, who make up our special forces. And uh, it's um, it was groundbreaking, and it's still uh, a terrific book.